Seeing the presence of a quorum, I will call to order this meeting of the Ernest Pelham Regional School Committee at 6.35 p.m. Uh, for you know, people's awareness, this meeting is being recorded for future broadcast based on stuff um, by Amherst Media. Uh, and the first order of business is approval of the minutes of October 22nd, 2019. I hope people have had a chance to see those minutes. Mr. Fonch? A uh, small item. In, uh, under in attendance, um, yeah. my first name is not Fip. It is not. It's not. It is Kip. Small detail. Okay. Kip with the K, right? That's correct. Okay. Uh, is it Donald? Um, in the first section under um, roll call was taken for the regional school committee. I believe um, I was there. Um, so my name is missing from that roll call vote. Okay. Um, and I believe for Union 26, Ms. Ordonez is missing from that list. Okay. I have a few others, too. Keep going. Okay. Um, under Section 2, it said t just a typo, resumed the meetings. Yeah. Under Section 4, third paragraph, the grade span advisory board or group is it group or board 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 um, where and is I, that again the first line of the third paragraph in section four okay there it is okay right there yeah yeah and then in this um, in continuing in that section it's down to the specifics of what are the pros the cons and I don't know that you meant the barriers to academics. And, but I wasn't quite sure what was intended there. Um, I think um, instead of the word barriers, as I recall, um, it's okay to um, yeah. say, um, I think within the, the areas of or arenas of. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Instead of barriers, <laughs> can we just say areas of instead of the word barrier? Um, Sorry, it's hard when I'm. Right back. Yeah. I, I just had a question in the section seven, paragraph one, two, three, four, the one that begins with Ms. Spitzer, and maybe yeah. um, Dr. Morris, you can um, clarify on that. I, I wasn't sure. This didn't match my remembrance, the infrastructure on fundraising, and then move forward with itemized budgets. I thought that it was the, because something more about a clear plan to then begin the fundraising, but. It looks like one of your colleagues would like yeah. to comment. Please. Well, I, I just, I'm trying to remember that conversation as well. And I think I was just saying that if we could start building the f infrastructure for the fundraising prior to having the plan complete. I mean, I don't know which one of us said that, but I think that was the gist of what we were. I That's agree. definitely what yeah. one of you said. Yeah, yeah one of us was. <laughs> 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 I think I believe I said that. That yeah. sounds like something I might say. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And I have one more. Okay. Um, in, sorry. In the transportation bid section, which is section C, I think. Yep. Um, on the top of the next page. Okay. Um, the second um, paragraph. Okay. I think the, the number one thing we could do to reduce carbon emissions, I think, is what's missing there is reduce the length of routes and increase the number of families. I think that's a, a critical piece that was missing from that mm -hmm. sentence. Um, and then in the next paragraph where it, the third line, well, second line starts with Ms. Stancer agrees, and then it says she also asked a question. I believe I was the one that asked the question. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Ms. McDonald asked a question regarding mm -hmm. the impact by shortening the routes. Um, yes, you're next. Spencer. And I think you might have also been the one who agreed about locking in the five-year contract. The sentence before that, I, I don't think that was me. So the missed answer agrees, I think, should be. Oh, so maybe just oh that's so name. funny. So you changed that to Ms. McDonald, and, and this one can be, she yep. also asked. Yes. 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 Right. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, yep. So two things. In on the next page. Okay, under policy discussion. Yeah, and it's the BDB section. BDB, yep. Um, the second paragraph, it 
said that I described that the policy committee that Margaret Miss Stancer should revisit the language regarding the officer duties of secretary. I don't think that was me, but I don't know who it was. Was that Ms. Ordonez or myself? It's it was one of the two of you. Yeah. That's my recollection. <laughs> yes, I think it was one of the two of you. You want to claim it? I'll claim it. And without going after the video, <laughs> we need our best recollection. And in the next to the last paragraph, um, under it's under the new anti-harassment policy. Yes. The last line of the next to last paragraph, Mr. Menino and Ms. Stancer describe that feedback from the chair of the committee. I think it should say the Pelham, the chair of the Pelham School Committee. Mm -hmm. I yes. think. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. That's it for me. Okay. Um, Mr. Demling uh, wrote me a note and said, inputs on minutes, item 7A, top of page 2. Uh, Mr. Demling had a question regarding timing and how long this would take if the schematic design is not done. Please add the word soon after done, not done soon. And that was his comment. Are there other edits? My recollection is I had another one someplace. Yep. Maybe it was at the, the next paragraph, or two paragraphs down right above section B, Mr. Nakajima noted capital projects. My recollection is that you were talking about that that should be done now. Uh, yeah. Um, that actually wasn't it. I was looking you're for, a, I was looking for, timing, I was looking for a what? highly clerical edit <laughs> that I saw earlier <laughs> on. But you're right about this one, too, that um, the last paragraph of the fields update, um, essentially the gist of the statement was that we needed to move forward with a plan uh, immediately hmm. uh, for schematic design and a budget for the fields because the town was engaged, Amherst Town of Amherst was engaged in debating very significant capital projects. And if we didn't get organized in a way that was actionable, um, we wouldn't be part of that conversation or able to advocate for the regional schools. A great summary of what I thought I said last week. Yes. I just noted you, that took me to something that mm -hmm. I, I see in um, the paragraph, the second paragraph on that page, Ms. Dancer had the opportunity to, to go to the consultants last spring. That should be this consultant's presentation last spring. Okay. Um, okay. Anything else? Yes. Um, on the last page um, in the section about the anti-harassment party, Mm -hmm. Party policy, excuse me. Is it um, the very last paragraph? Um, no, the last, the first paragraph of the last page, where okay, it says, Ms. Great. Spitzer asked where this policy applies because it is currently broad. And I, I understood where the policy applied, and qu my question wasn't so much where it applied, but more if it was um, overly broad in terms mm -hmm. of limiting speech in areas where we don't really have jurisdiction. Right. So that's a fancier way of say, saying what I was trying to get across. Um, Right. But it, it was more about whether it's it, it's too broad. I understood where it, where it did. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. So is there um, a move to approve the minutes of October 22nd as amended? So moved. Moved by Stancer. Is there a second? Second. Second by Fonch. Um, all those in favor of approving the minutes as amended? I got my hand. It carries one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven to nothing. Great. Uh, okay, so we'll move forward on the agenda. The next item is uh, committee. I, it's funny, we, ever since Ms. Stancer pointed this out, I feel like we have to have a different title for committee announcements because that just does sound wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the committee member announcements. Uh, um, that's good. If people, if committee members have any answers they'd like to make, they can do so at this time. Yes. Um, 
Unfortunately, you weren't able to join us for illness, but we had a wonderful night at the Amherst Education Foundation. Um, Ms. McDonald, Mr. Demling, and I, mm -hmm. and actually my, my stepdad stepped in as a member of our team, and we won a Spirit Award. So um, I just want to thank the Amherst Education Foundation <laughs> for the event, um, and we had a great time. That's awesome. Any other announcements? Seeing none, um, well, I'll now open up the floor to public comments. If anyone in front of the public has a comment, they can come forward. They have up to three minutes to speak. They need to identify themselves at the microphone. Um, for those watching uh, at home later, if you can't see, um, though we do have people in the audience who we're happy to have here, um, we do not have any public comments at this time. Uh, so with that, I'm going to close public comments. And just remind people again that you can write emails to us, snail mail, um, whatever you like to try to ensure we can get the input that you'd like us to have. <coughs> Superintendent? Sure. I'll be brief with the update tonight. Uh, two quick notes um, that aren't in the written update that's in the packet. Uh, one is that uh, related to the last meeting, I have reconnected with um, town manager uh, Paul Bachman about the fields and our discussion last week about the fields because there is implication, there are implications and Mr. Sullivan knows from being on that uh, group in the past couple of years uh, between fields that are owned by the town, fields that are owned by the region and just kept him abreast of that conversation and discussion because there'd be lots of interest on the town side of how that goes as well. Um, just very frankly, even if the region owned fields, particularly the track, uh, is widely used by the community. So um, he's been appraised of that. Uh, the other one, which I know is going to be an upcoming agenda more um, intentionally, is we did have a meeting last week, last Thursday, of the Great Span Advisory Group. Um, and I thought we made significant progress. Um, I think we got some good feedback from the committee members, the board members, uh, about accelerating, kind of getting pens to paper and writing things down, pros and cons. All those notes are uh, already reflected on our website so that um, it's a transparent process and people can see at least how board members are feeling, and we're looking forward, I'm looking forward, I don't want to speak for Ms. McDonald, to the next meeting where we debrief as a larger group uh, what we see as pros and cons, kind of what was talked about before in the notes last time, but I feel like um, we've done a lot of the understanding of the developmental needs and strengths of adolescent students, and so it was nice to um, feel like we were taking next steps in that regard. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you had anything you'd like to add. Yeah, no, I thought it was um, a, a good, um, session and a lot of a lot of you had stacks of papers um, to, <laughs> I haven't read through all of them but I also think um, in planning the, the next month's agenda and I think it's November 19th 18th, 18th, 18th yeah, like that, yeah. Um, there was a lot of conversation about the need to get even broader input from from the community and um, educators in in the schools more than the, the group already encompasses um, parents um, from around the, the district as well as educators from the elementary schools and the middle school. Um, but there was a strong desire to, to solicit and, incur and engage the um, broader community to get, um, understand the concerns and hopes and, and sort of questions that are coming up and, um, from the broader community. So. Oh, when do you expect to... Uh gather parental input, see what the parents think about the situation. Mm -hmm. You want me to either way? Yeah, yeah. so uh, the f my first comment is there is a, a predominant number of um, parents or caregivers in the group already. I'm not suggesting that answers your question, but I, I do think it's important to note that. Uh, and that's really what Ms. McDonald, I think, was speaking to that they're at the next meeting trying to develop a clear plan of engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the tricky things, we had a good conversation on this topic is, at what point do you begin to engage parents with kind of more formal <coughs> communication? Is it you do you wait till there's a plan, you know, that's more clear? Do you give progress updates? But you know, how helpful is that? So that's uh, on our agenda for our November meeting of how to kind of re engage and at the next at a regional meeting uh, directly following that I'd be happy to you know, I think Miss McDonald and I would be happy to share um, the results of that conversation. So yeah. 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 yeah okay. <laughs> so on the agenda, I'm just going to be very brief. Next Tuesday, which is election day, so there is no school uh, for students. There is, uh, it is a work day for staff. And so as we've done the last three years, um, our curriculum day 
We'll, in the morning will be a district-wide day that focuses on the topics of social justice and equity. Um, this particular year, um, Elijah, who I was talking with again today, will be our keynote speaker. He spoke last year at the Mass Glisten Conference um, and uh, is incredibly powerful describing his experience um, and, and particularly talking about intersectionality of identities. Um, so uh, more on that soon, but just uh, we're excited to have that day. We have about 20 or so workshops that are being led on, on a wide range of topics. Obviously in the paper version, it's not as neat, but if you got, when you got this electronically and what's on the website, if you click on that link, you'll, you'll be linked to the different workshops that staff members are choosing um, to engage in their work. Um, just a couple quick updates below that, and I think I'll, I'll keep it briefer. There's a fair amount of writing here. Just, uh, I referenced with Ms. Stewart last time that it's been a highly successful athletic season and just listed more details about the postseason, um, the, the sports that have qualified for postseason play already. And this is really uh, pretty much a hallmark season in my time, last couple years anyway, of our student athletes performing at a very high level. So congratulations to them and the athletics mm -hmm. department. Um, we had uh, Australian stud students coming um, and a number of students um, listed who hosted uh, families. And I think one of the things that we really appreciate is that we learn from students, and, and this is a very international community, and we try to, as best we can, uh, provide additional experiences for students around the world, as well as students here to experience that. And in today's digital times, that gets a little easier, actually. There's a number of projects, both at the elementary and secondary level, where students are able to collaborate and connect with students uh, living in very different contexts. Um, that describes it. We're very happy with our, on the flip side, our academic scholars, um, the National Merit Semifinal Corporation um, is one that sets up the National Merit Scholar Program and we had a significant number of students who were named as finalists and semifinalists. Uh, and again, congratulations to those students and the staff members who worked with them to achieve at the very high level. And I think that is, I'm gonna, as I said, I'm gonna try to keep it brief and I think I'll do that tonight. Any, for, any questions for the superintendent? There are none. That means it's time for the chair's update. For better or for worse. Um, so, uh, I, one of the things I wanted to talk to the community about today is we've talked previously about the fact that um, the, the chair, uh, not just of this committee, but of other committees, tends to be used as a sounding board for the superintendent uh, when things come up. Um, for that reason, uh, you end up getting apprised of, of more information, more communication than um, other members of the committee might, and for better or for worse, I mean, it's, people wanted to change that. There's a lot of inf information you could get if you really want to. Um, I smile only because most of it, the reality is if it's fun, the superintendent takes it directly to the committee. If it's complicated, he might talk it through with the chair of this committee or another. If it's really unpleasant, um, he'll almost always just talk to the committee, the chair of the relevant committee. And so the reality is, if were you to have the great pleasure of getting all this, what you're going to find out is you're you're an aggregator of unpleasant realities. Um, some of which could be incidents that have occurred where um, the proper teams need to evaluate what's happened and come to a good assessment and an appropriate one then essentially the superintendent will act as if the chair is uh, a representative of the committee and saying, look, I'm trying to handle this appropriately. I want to make sure somebody knows. Uh, I'm looking at another chair of another committee simply because I know it's not just true for this committee. It's true of the other committees as well. Um, one of the reasons why that's relevant for what I'm bringing up tonight is just because uh, we, we've started going into developing a policy around harassment um, by... Uh, it's a broad policy in terms of its potential application, but it's also talked about specifically members of the community harassing um, students or staff. And I just, I feel like we're at a point where I felt like, I, I felt a responsibility to talk more to the committee about what's going on, um, simply because in my observation, this is becoming a significant detriment to the functioning and operations of some of our individual schools, uh, as well as to staff members. I don't know if this is accurate to say, but is, I think it's getting bad enough that people are calling in sick because they're feeling um, 
like they're confronted with a hostile work environment or they're very uncomfortable. There are folks who are unsure how to handle their duties because of that. And essentially, when you look at the policy we were trying to develop, the, the notion that any individual incident that occurs could be seen as um, somebody having a bad day when they hit a keypad, um, but that when you start to aggregate it, what you get is you get something that looks more like harassment or bullying. I think the further point I'd make is that if you look at the language people choose to use, um, we, we had a really contentious conversation um, with multiple parties last spring about our athletic fields. And even in the most passionate moments in which, uh, honestly, the committee and the DPW and the superintendent and others were being accused of potentially um, neglecting our duties around the safety of children, which I, I can't think of there being um, a more sobering accusation that you could face in a school. Uh, the reality is what people were focusing on was the facts. They would say, come out to the field and look at the terrain, look at the rocks, look at the, how dry it is, whatever it is. They would say, look, just come with me to the fields. We can talk about what we're seeing here or what my child's experiencing. That's less true and becomes, I think, frankly, untrue entirely when somebody starts using language that itself by its nature um, is disparaging people's character, um, maligning them, or trying to make them deeply uncomfortable based on their identity or anything else. And I'll just, I'll give, I'll give one example of an email. And by the way, just to be clear to the public, although the policy we're developing, as Dr. Morris said repeatedly, is intended to solve any number of issues that come up, um, the reality is we're getting emails from a particular individual in the community, dozens of them. I forget what the total number is. But the point is this isn't a widespread issue. This is singular. And it's singular in a way, which is why we talk about um, knowing it when you see it in terms of the cumulative impact of it. And just as an example, I mean, I, there was an email sent to our attorney this past weekend that uh, questioned his competence, questioned his um, sense of uh, decency, um, also described me uh, as a, uh, a uh, what was it again, a uh, lonely, childless, sad, lonely, childless man who knows nothing about public education. Um, any number of those things could be true if somebody <laughs> wants to point them out. Uh, I don't really care. Uh, my point is, if you're trying to make a policy point and you think you have an intelligent and well-reasoned and well-documented point to make, you probably don't have to use language like that. Uh, similarly, I recall in the last few months there was an email in which a senior member of our administration was accused of having an affair with a prominent member of the public. There was, there was bluntly, the language I saw, it wasn't actually, there was another email I think the committee might have seen, but there was another email that I was, I was privileged to um, that was much more direct in its accusation or its smear. Um, there wasn't any truth to it, but also what I'd say, I'd, the point I'd make is, why does somebody even make comments like that? They make comments like that because they're trying to bully people uh, in ways in which the facts are not on their side. And also, and this is really to me the critical thing, is that if you, if, you know what it's, if you know what it's like to be, somebody asked me recently why I love doing what I do. And the comment I made to them is when I was a kid, I was the youngest of seven kids in my family and a very close um, uncle's family. And even though they were a loving family, everyone picked on me. And the funny thing is what I got out of that was I got a strong sense of looking for underdogs, looking for people who are being picked on, and understanding what the climate's like when people are picked on, right? And what you know is bullies get power when people are silent about it. They get, they, get, they, get, they get their power out of the idea that when somebody's sitting at work and gets an email, that email feels like their own private hell. And it feels like it's nobody else's. And that no one else necessarily would validate their feeling that they're under stress, or under strain, particularly if the person writing the emails is clever enough that, they, that it never quite seems actionable, which is one of the frustrations that I've had about this. But um, so I just would say, I'm going to leave names out of it, um, but uh, a quote from this individual. I did research and read article, and by the way, some of the grammatical challenges in here are from the emails themselves, so I apologize. I'm not going to correct the grammar. Uh, I did research and read articles about where my own patterns are coming out in order to examine what I'm actually saying. If all the individuals, quote, if all the individuals involved are Jewish, as I was told today, then what exactly is going on? 
There is another pattern that reveals a level of ethnocentric bias against investing in or dispersing equitable funding and privileged anyone outside of the Jewish faith. Now that was written to somebody who is Jewish. And the clear accusation is that they're behaving in a way that is biased based on their religion. Um, if you know anything about anti-Semitism, that's anti-Semitic, flat out. Um, another, another comment, not once has ARPS ever been upfront honest about anything but a group of manipulative group a group of manipulative group of deceitful a-holes. Mike said I, kids might be watching and I should be careful with my language. Although the person writing wasn't careful with their language, just to be clear. That's the entire point. And I want to go back to the point I made a moment ago. If you've got, as harsh as the critique can be, if you've got a reasoned argument, you can make your reasoned argument as hard as it can be. You can say the committee's not doing its job. You can say the superintendent's not doing their job. But it's unlikely you would write, if you're trying to do anything other than bully someone, that a slob of a human, such as the person referenced, who wouldn't even be hired to work in the back room of Home Depot, quote unquote. That was about as professional as, fill in the blank, wearing pajamas to work for the last 10 years. Another quote from another email. That's slob of a human. Uh, another quote. Bring that old hag if you want, fill in the blank to the person. Uh, you can call your sleazy lawyer. Um, you, you use the school district to project your own ethnocentric ideology. Uh, you were killing a child. You were killing a student. You almost chill, killed this child. ARPS is like the Catholic Church, and you are, you are all not different than the priests. Presumably that's referenced in the clergy <laughs> sex abuse scandal. The next phrase in that email said, Mida keneged mida, which is, uh, what is that? Hebrew. Hebrew. Hebrew expression says what goes around comes around. Um, and again, the recipients of that email were two people who were Jewish, um, one of whom also received the earlier email that referenced the idea that the hiring and investing patterns were biased based on that person's religion. So that's what we're dealing with. just want to be clear about this stuff. That's what we're dealing with. Uh, not once did you fill in the blank or that slob of a human fill in the blank ever effing respond to a single goddamn attempt that I've made um, to support this job. Uh, soon, you, fill in the blank, are going to have a harder time getting, getting unlimited access to waste school funds without your, poor, your pool boy. Uh, to another person, again, time to retire. You've done enough, thank you very much, you homophobic old woman, who I couldn't dot, dot, dot. Um, see. Uh, it's unclear how you secured. It's hard not to say who this is without reading the email. I guess I'm reading the email. It's unclear how you managed to secure assistant superintendent out that debacle lawsuit. Did you threaten one? Took advantage of the school committee who didn't have a clue about licensure evidenced by their total confusion at every turn? Um, uh, you could have stopped. This is also very blunt. Uh, white rash woman I'm going to quote instead what, was, what somebody highlighted here for me white rash woman who intentionally got pregnant to force equal attention from a divorced man with another child because he was jealous of his ex-wife the, the email goes on from there I'm going to, I'll, I'll stop at that point but, but the, and there's believe it or not from what I've been told there's actually a much longer pile of them, I know that there's a longer pile of ones that I've seen that attack school committee members because some of them also similarly get very, very personal. Again, I just want to repeat this, especially because I know the public will be watching. I'm not saying, I've never heard a member of this committee say that if you, if you really dislike what we're saying, you may come before the microphone and speak in ways that are unartful, ways that you might regret later the language you use. Speak with an intense amount of passion about how much you think we're making a mistake in the decisions we're making. There's nothing about what I'm saying in terms of bringing forward this as a problem that is criticizing that in any way. If you have a problem with what we're doing, bring it on. We want, we actually, in fact, we need to hear from you. If we don't, we can't learn, we can't do a better job, we can't hold Mike accountable or anybody else who works here in this district. But there's a different tenor and a different tone if you're going to smear people's characters, um, uh, characterize them in ways that make them feel uncomfortable. I've had other ones at, at me that are similar in that way. 
And, um, and also just to point out that because this is something that's not happening publicly, it's happening through emails, which are public records, but they're happening through emails, what, what the, the clear intent is to create multiple cells of little private hells people are going through where they feel put upon, they feel isolated, they feel extra burdened in their job, and they're finding it more difficult to bring their best self and their best professional self at the work that they're doing. Um, so, uh, I, you know, I, 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 the reality is, I'm just going to say this bluntly, the reality is if, if we collectively as a community can't find a way to change what's happening and change the culture of what's happening, um, we're going to drive people out of this district who work here. We're going to change our ability to get our work done effectively and well. And, I, and I'm not trying to make a big thing of this, but I actually think we've made a lot of progress as a school committee over the last couple of years. And um, a lot of that could be backslid because ultimately our effectiveness is the people who work here. And so if they're not supported and able to do a good job, then um, this enterprise doesn't succeed, and doesn't grow. Um, so I don't, so I'll, ta I'll take some comments or questions, but this wasn't an item on the agenda, so I want to be careful about how far we go. Mr. Uh Well, first of all, I think it should very much be on the agenda. Um, so don't, don't apologize for it not being there. I think every member of this committee should have an opportunity to address this kind of nonsense. But having said that, I appreciate your comment about um, inviting people to come to the microphone and say it to us in our faces. Um, I think you can dare them to do that. Um, I appreciate your reading these in public because I think most of the public doesn't know about this. And if they watch um, Amherst Media, they will know about it. Um, I think sadly and tragically, I don't see this as new. I do see it as intensifying over the last 15 to 20 years, but it's nothing new. This kind of stuff has happened before in, in Amherst. And that's a sad statement to make about the community that we all either live in and or work in. And last, um, um, I'm sorry, next to the last, people have already left long before this nonsense came out because this is fairly common in Amherst, this kind of um, character assassination, this, this kind of belittling and um, disgracing people's reputation is not, not new. And people have left. People in high levels of administration in this district have left. And finally, as much as I regret having to ask for this, I would like to have a copy of the uh, one that you read that is explicitly anti-Semitic. Mm -hmm. Being Jewish, I would like to share that with Rabbi Weiner uh, so that he knows what's um, going on in the community. I think he has a right to know that. Happy to do it. Anyone else? I mean, I, I've given, given him an opportunity. I just wanted to say uh, thank you to the chair for bringing this up publicly. Um, I've, you know, both been the subject of some of these attacks but also witnessed uh, the incredible number of attacks that administrators in this district and school committee members have um, received from this one individual. And I believe that it is one individual. I think this person has claimed that they are speaking for multiple people previously, but the only evidence that we have is that it is one person who has been undergoing <coughs> a campaign, basically, against this district, uh, primarily because the district is not doing the things that she believes the district needs to be doing. Um, and everyone is entitled to their opinion. The public, we welcome public opinion and we welcome it when it's different from ours. Um, but when it's this level of abuse and attack and is driving people from our district, as, as Mr. Fonch has uh, stated, um, that is when you know it should be alarming to our community that we mm -hmm. have a, such a sustained level of attack and vitriol being directed at individuals. And again, it's around character assassination, not even just, dis you know, it's not factual disagreements. Right. It's uh, claims being made based on hearsay, uh, you know, gossip that has been heard, and then immediately uh, launching into attacks against people based on very little factual information. And I personally have requested this person to come forth and share any factual information or evidence that exists. I believe that the chair has done so yes. as well. Um, and we're still waiting for other things other than just uh, accusations. And so when it gets to this level of, of attack, 
Um, it can only be called a campaign. It can only be called as somebody who will not stop until all of us basically quit, and this person has said that publicly as well. Um, that's just not the way that democracy works. I'm sorry. It's, you know, that, that's one individual who's, who's serving their own needs and their uh, agenda. And so I have a severe problem with that because I think that if the rest of the community were given an opportunity to hear from this person um, the facts that they claim to have, then they could make their own decisions about whether or not this is true. But I think in the, the kind of uh, tactics that this person has been using um, doesn't allow for anyone else to actually weigh in or, or provide an opinion or anything like that. And I think as far as the anti-Semitic comments, it's also been several protected classes that have been named. Yes. Um, and that is incredibly, uh, you know, uh, mortifying to me that we are in an environment where we have one individual of the community who is making these, you know, consistent attacks against protected people. We have had pregnant women. We have had people of color, uh, you know, in name, I mean, the names that are, that are launched against them and the way that they've been, they've been addressed uh, in these emails is, is horrifying. Um, and I don't particularly see myself as a person who's very sensitive to that kind of thing. I've worked in environments before where people are very cruel and, you know, can say things that whatever's on their mind. And we're not looking to police speech, uh, but we cannot allow in good conscience our staff and our administrators to be driven out that way simply because they're afraid to turn on their emails in the morning. You know, and the crazy thing about it is, is that if you, if you had some, but first off, I firmly believe if someone was using that kind of language uh, publicly, like at the microphone, then the entire community would turn uh, against them or at least let them know what they thought of it. Um, I have no question of that. Um, but I think when you use that kind of language in individual emails that are essentially, even though it's public records, public emails that would work, essentially they're private moments. Like you get to work, you have a cup of coffee in your hand, you look at your email for a minute, and boom, what comes at you is something that's per assaultive to you in terms of the nature of your what your identity is, who you are, and making you uncomfortable, it's the very it's the very nature of a civil rights violation, actually, of someone coming forward and just trying to live their life and get, you know have as good or bad a day at work as anyone ever does professionally, and all of a sudden they have to have this wave coming at them of uh, of hostility based on who they are as a person. And the other thing I'd say too is that. Um, the emails, and I think the committee has seen some of these, the emails are a real grab bag because the more public-facing ones will talk about policy and budget <clears throat> in vague ways. But if you, if, you, if you public record requested the broad set of emails that actually have gone to members of the school committee as well as to the superintendent and others, um, they're actually much more directive. I want you to fire this particular person. In their place, I want you to hire this other specific named person. Now, if you're, again, you talk about, as, as my uh, colleague, Ms. Zardoni has talked about what you do in a democracy or in a government. Um, if you want to talk about good process and best practice, best practice is not somebody wielding um, innuendo and slander to say, you have to spend $1,000 more on this line item, then you need to fire this specific person. Oh, and by the way, I have the replacement lined up, and you better hire them. And I think the... the, the uh, the interpolation is, or else I won't quit, and I'll keep harassing you and bullying you and intimidating you until you do. And so the reason I bring this up is because, again, if, if you even look at sort of the end, at, the end, at the end of this journey and say, well, what is this all in the service of? You'd say, well, goodness, you can't have one individual of the community or one member of this committee, anybody, saying, well, I've decided I, I, want, to, I want to override everyone else's judgment and substitute my judgment for everyone else's, not just on the broad parameters like you could do if you went for committee and say, well, can't we do the budget differently? Which is a very reasonable thing to ask. And instead, or are our priorities right? Could we put more money here or there? But specifically say, uh, I guess I had an unpleasant interaction one day in one of our schools. Uh, I don't like this person, and I'm going to go on a relentless campaign until they're either fired or so uncomfortable that they quit. These are the emails that members of the staff have been getting. Relentlessly, relentlessly. It's wrong. So um, we're going to have to keep talking about what we do. Um, I've, I, I'm saying this also because the superintendent, everyone in the district answers the superintendent. And so I think um, this, he has a burden to carry to try to ensure that we have the best possible work environment 
for um, all of the staff, um, as well as the best environment for all the kids. Um, but who does he turn to um, if the pressure is boiling? Us. Us. So I'm not asking, again, it will be on the future agenda, probably on the 12th or next meeting, but I'm just saying I'm bringing it up now because the committee has to be aware this is very, very serious. It needs to be dealt with. It's a significant problem. And we've on to subcommittee updates. Any subcommittee updates? Yes, Ms. Nizzer. Um, so we had a budget and finance subcommittee meeting just before this one, and uh, three things from that. Um, we reviewed the fees, the list of fees, which, and this information will all come to the entire committee at some point. But um, we had a first look at the fiscal year 21 capital budget, and we chose a date um, to invite uh, budget and select board people from the four towns to talk, begin the conversation about assessments. Great. So there will be more coming. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Any other committees? Yes. Uh, the policy subcommittee is going to be meeting on the 11th, Monday the 11th at 5.30, um, where we'll be continuing our work on the policies we discussed at last week's regional committee meeting. Anything further? Seeing nothing, uh, we will move on. Uh, transportation bid under new doing business item 6A, in which we could anticipate possibly voting to authorize a three-year contract term with two additional one-year options for a maximum of five years. The transportation contract that will begin on July 1st, 2020. And this is to authorize you to offer a bid that includes these terms. Mr. Mangano, welcome. Welcome. Uh, thank you. And so, Yes, last time we met on this agenda item, we shared a bunch of feedback and different things that would go in the specs, which we'll, we'll do our best to incorporate. Um, we continue to welcome that feedback either through, through communications to Mike, oh, that's good, um, communications to Dr. Morris, um, or emailing myself or Rupert, um, our facility director. But this vote in particular is really just about including that one clause in the bid package to offer the five-year contract. Just, just to add to that, the reason it comes to school committee is any contract that extends beyond three years needs to be voted by the school committee. So the reason in, in particular it comes to the committee is because uh, we're asking you to approve looking at more than a three-year contract for the transportation bid. Okay. Uh, obviously, we talked about this last week. Uh, it was last week, wasn't it? It yep. was. Yeah, it was. <laughs> are, there, are, there, are there any questions from Mr. Mangano <clears throat> or comments? Yes, just a clarification, this is the way that the current contract is built, correct? So, yeah, our current yeah. contract was a three plus one plus one. Yep. Okay. And the plus ones are at the sole discretion of the school committee, so it's completely your call to extend it to a five-year. Okay. Okay. May I make a motion? Sure. I move to authorize a three-year contract term with two additional one-year options for a maximum of five years for the transportation contract that will begin on July 1, 2020. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, move on, second McDonald. Any further discussion or debate? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify on, raising your hand. Uh, it carries. And what do we have here? One, two, three. We have eight people. Thank you. Right? Yes, eight to nothing. Great. Uh, item seven, uh, 6B, strategic planning update for the high school. Yes, all of this, this, this is an update only, not a... Not voting on anything. And uh, as Mr. Jones is coming up, just a, a brief uh, context sharing. Um, so last year we went through a pretty thorough strategic planning process, and as was shared end of last year and then the beginning of this year in terms of my goals, the real work of this of this year is at all three of the regional schools to take those broad district-wide goals and bring them into what are the initiatives at the school level that will contribute to those goals. How do we prioritize those ones that happen at the school level versus, versus those that are happening at the district? And to come up and, and bring back later this winter uh, what that looks like at the school level, how to operationalize. Because if you remember the strategic plan, it was uh, very ambitious, but it was also uh, at a pretty broad level. And so Mr. Jones is going to update us on his work with the high school faculty and staff of taking those broad goals and making them more actionable and specific at the high school level. So thank you for coming, Principal Jones. Well, thank you, Dr. Morris, uh, committee members, Dr. Morris. We're very excited about the uh, 
uh, New Beginnings at Amherst Regional High School and the strategic plan. Um, early fall, as we started the year and faculty was uh, getting to know me and vice versa, we took the plan from a, a perspective of the moral imperative, uh, work done by Michael Fullen. And we wanted teachers to identify in the beginning what are they passionate about and what are they committed to. And this was an activity where they took two words or two phrases and put them together. It was so powerful that we put it on our board as you come into the building. So as you walk into the building just in front of the main office, you will see that we are ARHS, and you will see what we are committed to and what we're passionate about. And this all came from the teachers. Every statement there that you see on there is teacher-driven. And it really says a lot about what we're about here at ARHS. The moral imperative, as we defined it, was shift. It was a shift from stating the vision to creating the reality. So the initiatives that we would be doing would be creating that reality. As Dr. Morris uh, uh, gave us the charge, if you will, that the objectives and the uh, uh, outcomes are already pretty much written in stone by 2023, we can now put those initiatives in based on the objectives. In September, a few weeks later, uh, we introduced the plan itself because, because some of our faculty and some of our new staff had not seen the actual document. And we wanted them to see it. We kind of spelled it out. There was some terminology that they uh, had some uh, concerns about that they wanted to discuss and further define. Uh, and also, we were integrating the moral imperative in as the umbrella of the strategic plan. And of course, you see the objectives here from A to F, uh, going from uh, increasing our diversity in our staff, uh, strengthening our instructional practices. And just to say, uh, I've given the charge to our administrative team to be in classrooms every day. Mm -hmm. uh, personally, I'm in at least five classrooms every day. And that's just not do observations. That's what I call just passing through and to reaffirm all the good things that are happening in our classes. Uh, also, uh, strengthening our instructional practices, as I mentioned before, and having their cultural identities uh, with students of color, pretty much what was just being said earlier. Uh, we have certain courses that address a lot of different issues, and we have very uh, much diverse groups in our classes. Uh, the emotional well-being of our students. Uh, restorative justice has been very successful in its full implementation this year. Uh, Mr. Mendez, who is our coordinator for climate and culture, here in the building has been meeting with students and beginning second semester will kick off our course in restorative justice. And he's been uh, aggressively recruiting students for that program as well as other organizations that are offshoots of our restorative justice program. Uh, wide learning opportunities and uh, which are also of course uh, speak of restorative justice. But as we look down the road and in initiatives, uh, what other opportunities can we have academically for our students to broaden their range of uh, ways in order to have postgraduate opportunities. Uh, and of course, we talked about our fields, but our instructional plan. Uh, I must say that, you know, coming here, I'm very impressed with what we have. We have some great bones to work with, and I think we can expand our instructional program here at ARHS. And of course, our outcomes. And this is what we will see by 2023, which can change. You know, sometimes you have to adjust to some things that may occur, but they will all be in a positive for student success. Uh, just recently at our early release day, October, in the cafeteria, we moved from our normal setting here. We sat by departments. Uh, our paraeducators were involved. They were so excited because they are now being asked to be a part of what we're doing here. So everyone is a part of this decision making. Uh, we talked about what lies beneath. And we took uh, a video from uh, Robert Spicer, who's in Chicago, who's a restorative justice expert. And one of the things that he talked about was the iceberg. What's below? Because we know what's on top. But what are the strengths and our challenges below the iceberg? Navigating an iceberg, you see an activity that teachers 
We're able to work in groups. Do you see how many posters are there? There are a lot of good positive things <laughs> and some challenges mm. that we're identifying, and we'll identify those things through our initiatives through the strategic plan. We had turn and talk uh, activities as well as what you see on the, on the right picture of identifying and defining implicit bias. We gave some examples as well as the term white supremacy. That was a term that they were having a little bit of, you know, angst about and wondering where did it come from in terms of the development of the document. But there was also a uh, article that some uh, had read prior to and there was discussion. There were some people from departments who were on the planning committee and explained how the term came about. But what we're looking at is the initiatives, so it doesn't become a term that we really worry about because we're about all, and all does mean all here at ARHS, and that's how we're going to do it. Oh. Our next steps, um, as early as tomorrow, we will identify three focuses from the objectives. So it could be ob objectives B, C, and D. Mm -hmm. We're looking at you know ranking, and that will be our focus throughout the whole year and looking at initiatives that will be able to uh, be implemented with those objectives. And as we look at each down week period, we'll be monitoring some best practices, where we are, and then from there, at the end of the year, where do we stand? How well did we do? Next year, we'll pick right up with the three and maybe add one more. So we'll have four. And then by 2023, we'll match it. Now, the last objective, I believe, is Objective F, that's a little bit more building-wise. But we can also say, how can we use the building that we currently have and make it uh, for our students? We have three uh, 3D printers in the building, and our teachers are ready to use that for that STEM outlook. Uh, these go to the initiative, the hows, how we'll be able to do this. Restorative justice, interweaving that through the strategic plan, and we, I think we already are identified that I believe it's B, C, D, and a little bit of E already can fit into uh, this, this, the strategic plan. And Mr. Mendez and I have already been uh, talking about that in discussion and getting that in play. Uh, finally, uh, we'll have student input with our new newly formed student advisory committee. Uh, we had our first meeting about two weeks ago. We'll have our next meeting on November 4th, and we'll do the uh, activity of navigating our icebergs and having the students give input. We've added teachers, now we have students, put them both together. Mm -hmm. And also identifying and uh, defining their version of implicit bias here uh, and our challenges and our strengths and what we have that can combat that. And that's pretty much where we are and moving forward. We said this is not a race mm -hmm. of a sprint, it's, uh, as I told, uh, as I asked Chris Gould for his uh, expertise, it's a cross-country meet, a couple of hills, a couple of valleys, <laughs> but then we'll get to the goal when it's straight ahead. Uh, if there are any questions, I'll entertain those. Wonderful. Any questions for the committee? Yes. I just want to say, Principal Jones, I mean, it is absolutely a delight to, to hear uh, the way that you've taken, especially the restorative justice program, but, you know, the input from uh, administrators and teachers and uh, educators throughout the school, as well as students, and incorporated that into your strategic planning process and thinking. Um, I've had the pleasure of talking with you several times about your plans and what you want, you're trying to achieve, and I know that your conversations with the School Equity Task Force have also been greatly appreciated. Uh, your openness around the restorative justice program in particular and how you've embraced it and, and really you know, uh, want to help it see it succeed um, and grow in the school. Um, so I just, I just wanted to comment on that. I think it's, it's a wonderful step forward for our district and for our school. I know the students are better for it. Uh, all of us, quite frankly, are better for it. And so just wanted to commend you for that. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, and it's, 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 it's been fun. Uh, we are very excited about what we're doing, and uh, tomorrow we'll go to another level, and we'll see it come to its uh, eventual reality. And uh, as we said before, not just stating it, but making it a reality.
a follow-up question. Um, when do we see like a, a what the strategic plan actually is? Is there a document uh, as a product? What does it end up looking like when you're done with this process? I think if you look at the objectives as well as the outcomes, in between there, if you want, if you're looking at it in a document in between the filling, are the initiatives, um, and I think you'll also see another document that I've used before which is kind of like a check-in, I call it a nine-week report, where we can be looking at our focus areas, what we're, how we're monitoring them, and how we're doing at that point. And there could be some other things that I'll ask faculty for input. Uh, there's the instructional side of uh, how we're doing academically, as well as the managerial side of what we're putting in as the initiatives. So, you know, it, it really depends on where we land on the objectives. Say, for instance, if it's... Uh, the instructional piece. Well, we'll be looking at certain instructional look for us in the classroom as we do our walkthroughs and how we're uh, moving forward on that, uh, data collection and how we're using data collaboratively. So I'm just using some examples. Mm -hmm. uh, if it is some expansion of some programs, like we said with STEM and restorative justice, uh, Mr. Mendez has already given me a report on how we're doing so far with connecting with students, how many conferences we, we've had so far, and the success and follow-up. So with that, you can probably see some data of what I call quick wins, as well as where do we go next in our next steps. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So we haven't done, um, we have a process that we do on the committee um, about our budget guidance, where we um, work with Mr. Mangano and the superintendent to identify areas that we want to hear about more. But also what that's tied to is the committee hopefully providing feedback of areas when we're looking at the budget, we want to provide support, or at least we want to know what's going on, so we can right. we can weigh in to say, hey, that sounds important to us. We'd love to know more about it. So one of one of um, my my hope is it sounds like you're on track to do this. My hope is that some of the ideas that you and your team are coming up with will be um, baked baked and just baked enough, anyways, <laughs> uh, if not more than that, um, that they could that they could come back to us and have an impact on what your budget requests are. Um, I mean, and I don't, I don't, no, no idea where you land, of course, but I know that, um, and I'm sure you know this, that outcome one mm -hmm. is one in which there's just been so much conversation and so much um, passion, especially because you can, you, I think you can look at that kind of like a sort of justice, actually, as a really affirmative set of interventions or initiatives that brings your school to a different place that is like nothing but positive, right? It's just a wonderful Absolutely. thing to see kids taking advantage of, of different opportunities, AP courses and everything like that. Uh, and so I'm, I'm, I don't know why I'm throwing this out, but I guess because this is what we do. <laughs> if you, I don't know if you have anything to come back for us on that, that's a, a, that, that is an outcome one or influence, you know, that, that's basically an initiative that looks towards getting towards outcome one. But... Um, if so, I'm going to be a big cheerleader to making sure it gets fit. Well, Mr. Nakajima, you might as well start cheering. <laughs> uh, we're looking at the PSAT results mm -hmm. when they come in, and that's where you get your AP potential. So we can start looking there as we look towards for next year with students uh, signing up for courses yeah. and identifying those students who we can encourage to take AP courses. The next would be providing that support, which... Our teachers are here every day, right. uh, except for Wednesdays when we have meetings on, on some Fridays, uh, where we can now start looking at identifying students and providing that support. Uh, one of my firm beliefs is that students who do take uh, higher rigor courses do, weather, do well in four-year schools, of course, uh, graduating on time, and just being exposed to the rigor. You may not get the, the three or better, but if you get a two or a one, you've been exposed to the rigor. And it has you well prepared. Uh, we've just been uh, having some discussion about uh, bilingual identification, so things such as the access and programs like that to encourage our students to be uh, more proficient in those areas. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely a push. Uh, I'm very happy that we have our college counselor on board who has been very aggressive in getting a lot of students uh, signed up in various programs, our family center, mm -hmm has been working very hard with uh, getting students exposed and my prior experience uh, working with students uh, to 
uh, not just historically black universities and colleges, but other post-secondary options in the world of work and career work uh, experiences. Uh, that's pretty much where we're looking to be heading. Awesome. Nothing more exciting. There's nothing more exciting to hear. Yes. It really isn't. Um, I want to go around the table if anyone has anything else. Mr. Punch? Yes. Um, yes congratulations. Well, thank you, sir. As far as you've gotten, and yeah. best wishes for the rest of the journey. Thank you. Um, I, I do have one question, though, and that's regarding the student advisory group. Mm -hmm. Can you, would you describe the composition of that group? Yes. And in particular, um, I can recall that there were um, many students who were kind of um, melted into the walls and disappeared as a result. And I'm wondering if you've identified any of those as quiet but important students to add to the group. I would say from the first meeting that we had, and there are probably some other students joining uh, from my understanding, but it's a, definitely a cross-section of the school in terms of race, gender, and grade level. Uh, some of the students, I, of course, see in the building, a couple I met for the first time in terms of knowing them by name. Uh, but I can say that that group uh, has a pretty good pulse on uh, what they want to see in the building. I was very impressed with some of their questions. Uh, when we have our meeting on the 4th, we'll be talking about some academic instructional things that they want to uh, uh, delve into, uh, which I was very impressed that they had those questions or they had identified those things. Uh, but we definitely want to include as many students as we can because some of their subject areas of terms of agenda items we're reaching out to students in a very diverse uh, manner and that, that, that last comment is my next question how were they chosen um, it was really uh, an open uh, invitation from my understanding uh, uh, Liz Haygood our student activities coordinator had put the uh, invitation out uh, students heard it in announcements from uh, what I could see. Uh, one of our teachers uh, wanted to become the sponsor, and it kind of took a life of its own. Uh, it's not, to be honest with you, it's not the normal students you would see from student council or other organizations. It's a very broad uh, range uh, group of students that have uh, joined so far. Thank you. Other, I guess I'm going to go the table. Other committee members have anything they want to ask? Um, just a casual question. Students who take an AP course and get a one, do they feel the effort was worth the rigor? Well, you know, the thing about it is one thing that I've had as a philosophy is that if you get a one, you've been exposed to the rigor of being ready and being prepared for college because of how the course is being taught. Uh, unfortunately, you know, getting a one doesn't get you the credit. In some schools where you get a five, you don't get the credit depending upon what you major in and the school. Uh, but we still want to encourage students to be as rigorous as they can, to provide the support that we can, and hopefully that they get a three or above. But if they got a one, they're not a loser because they've been exposed to rigor that when they go to a uh, two or four year school, they'll be prepared for that type of work. Stancer? Um, so I hear a lot of talk about AP and about academics. What about the students who are probably not going to go that way? Mm -hmm. Are they included in this also? Yes, they are. I mean, that's always been an issue in Amherst. Well, uh, that's why we're talking about change. Uh, if you look at one of the uh, objectives there, providing those opportunities where you talk mm -hmm. about STEM, uh, Korean tech programs, uh, school to work, uh, as we look at the budget, mm -hmm. and I know that's an issue, but you also have to have a plan of how to incrementally put that in when you do have uh, budget mm -hmm. issues. Okay. So, uh, as I said, we have good bones here. Mm -hmm. uh, every time I look to the left of my office, I go down the hallway and make a right, and I go down the hallway, I see something that's a lab that could be really, really good to provide opportunities for students uh, in a variety of ways. Mm -hmm. And if I go to the back of the building uh, with the woodworking, welding, uh, more of your hard uh, Korean tech options, as well as a studio mm -hmm. and the 3D printers and what we could do with that and have students create some amazing things, not just some nice things, but things that could help the community. Mm -hmm. And the creativity of our students uh, 
we could do some things here and take this to another level for our students to be uh, uh, leaving here with a certification mm -hmm. um, in certain areas such as uh, mechatronics. Uh, there's some uh, openings here in the, in the valley from what I've seen mm -hmm. and we can have them ready. So as we talk about budget, we may have to have that discussion. Okay, well I'm glad to hear that because I, I've been in the valley for 40 years and know mm -hmm. a lot of people and I know that, um, for example, when my daughter graduated mm -hmm. from Amherst, um, they posted all the names of the people in the schools they were going to, but mm -hmm. not everybody was going to school. So there mm -hmm. was this segregation that happened between the academic students and the others, and I think in that particular case, they were made to feel less, and uh, the students that weren't going to mm -hmm. college, and so I hope, hope you bring that into this also. Yes, we are. Uh, one of our goals is to have a comprehensive high school. Great. And when we say comprehensive, that's across the board. If you look at our guidance office, you'll see a huge map of the United States and a small map of Massachusetts, because we want to be a little personal. But on that map, we'll have where students are going. Not only just the college, but career and tech schools. And it'll wipe out in August, and we start it up again. So in other words, it's a kind of a visual of mm -hmm. where students can see where they're going. And it's also our way of keeping us accountable where we send students. So uh, looking at what we have on campus mm -hmm. uh, and looking also at what we could possibly start with in terms of uh, career to work, uh, we have to look at the budget, look at a few things of how to make it work. Uh, but if we can, we can include students, say, from Summit Academy, uh, special needs students, uh, students who have English as second language as well as our students who have uh, been here for the whole time mm -hmm. and give them options and opportunities to be successful post high school. Great. Yes. Okay. Uh, Dr. Morris, do you have something you want to say? Um, I'll pass. Okay. Thank you, though. Um, <laughs> May I? Yeah, of course. One more question. Um, actually, it's not a question. I guess it's a comment. Um, when discussion uh, focuses on things like AP, um, resources for honors level students and so on and so forth. Um, I never or seldom, if ever, hear references to the budget. But hearing um, someone talk about those kids who aren't going to go to college and who are going to be interested in more of a vocational direction, um, suddenly the budget comes up. And I, I'm not sure I feel good about that. Um, and I'm wondering if um, there are efforts to um, identify those youngsters as early as eighth grade mm -hmm. so that they could be directed to Smith. We can or do. Franklin. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and I'll let, I'll, I'll let uh, Dr. Morris also weigh in, and I'm, I could too, but I'll defer to uh, Dr. Morris. Yeah, so uh, I think a couple of things. One, in relation to the budget. Um, I think when we're talking about things that are different than we're currently doing, there are budgetary implications. So I, th I think it's a point well taken to that, you know, perhaps the way I'm interpreting your comment fairly or unfairly is that, you know, when Principal Jones is talking about programs that don't currently exist in our school that are more geared for students to enter the workforce instead of enter higher education, we're talking about budget, but that's mm -hmm. an artifact of the fact that historically, at, like many comprehensive high schools, most of the budget attention has been... Uh, more focused on college readiness. And then that, if you look back 10, 15 years ago, no one was saying college or career ready. They were just talking about getting to college. Mm -hmm. So it's been a shift in educational thinking. Uh, I think it's been, in my personal opinion, a positive shift that we're thinking about that. Mm -hmm. You know, we have something like, uh, and I'm, the data's going to be a little wrong, but, you know, if you look at students who attend colleges from U.S. high schools and then graduate from colleges, uh, you know, the graduation, graduating from a four-year college with a bachelor's is less than 50% of students who graduate high school. I think last, and, and I'm, I'm hesitant to the numbers, but I think a couple years ago I was at a conference and it was in the neighborhood of a third. So the idea is even if you doubled that, you'd still have a third of the students who are not graduating with bachelor's degrees and somehow uh, we need to think of better pathways. We've, we've partnered, you know, um, so, so I think when we mm -hmm. think about the budget, we're thinking from that framework. 
framework, I think as it relates to middle school students, that's actually part of a larger conversation that's coming up at our grade span advisory actually about how, what's our programming look like at the middle school level because the reality is we've expanded quietly perhaps. Uh, a lot of our programs, existing programs at the high school in terms of woodworking, CAD, computer lab, um, a lot of the staff that's there have expanded their program. Some of that has come as new courses to this committee over the last few years, and yet we don't have reflected similar coursework at the middle school level. And so separate from vocational piece, which is fine, uh, what I think you know, we're sensing, or I'm just saying I'll say, what I'm sensing we need to think about is what's the pathway to that and how do students, if they want to go to voc school, fantastic, and that can be a great fit, but what are we building internally for our students, not just at the high school, but 7 through 12, so that they can take advantage of all the offerings and perhaps expand the offerings at the high school. Um, and so I think if you looked, if you did a mapping of our courses that are, are looking at least to have the potential to be more career readiness, you'll see a fair amount of them at the high school. You will not see them reflected as much at the middle school level. And, and so when students get to high school, uh, for many students, they're experiencing these courses for the first time, and we'd like to think about how that would be different in the future. So that was a long-winded answer, but I think it's, it was an important it's, and it's worth And it's worth a conversation yeah. for another time, too. Yeah. And I think um, you were giving us a taste of what you're doing. Absolutely. Um, it's been more of an entree. Uh, <laughs> and that's, that's, very well, that's very welcome. Well, I, I didn't want to put too much of an entree out there, but no, it's good. The, the, the plate was just a little bit big. That's right. No, but we're going we're to be back at this conversation again Absolutely. soon, I hope. Okay. And thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Appreciate it. The next item in the, uh, is the warrant signing process. Um, without question, one of the more scintillating topics that we can have <laughs> around our payroll and other expenditures. Sure. So just there was two questions that, and this is what's going around, that the committee asked me to find an answer to, or to request an answer to from Council uh, that came up last week's meeting. The first is if there was an individual who was, um, if the committee goes to the model where an individual is designated to sign warrants and update the committee, what would that look like? So the first paragraph describes, this is from our attorney, um, Mark Terry, describes what that process would look like, which uh, he uses quotes intentionally to suggest this is literally a statement that could be read and filled in at each meeting. Um, I think there was, the way I understood it, the concern the last meeting is would they literally, would the person literally need to read every line item in the warrant? And the short answer is no. Um, that, you know, it would have to give summaries by general fund, revolving fund, and grant fund, and payroll. Those would be the four areas that would need reporting out in terms of the, the finances for each. Um, and the second question that I was asked to find out about is the subcommittee model. And I think I'll just read this for members of the public as well. So the subcommittee model is also permissible as a delegation of the full committee's authority, but it does require compliance with open meeting law, whereas as a, the delegation to an individual does not. And because the action would be one of a governmental government body, there would have to be a motion and vote to approve the warrants. The committee uses subcommittee model. There's no need for the reporting described above. Um, so that was the answer to those crew questions. And again, the, the potential vote anyway, the language on there is essentially uh, whether the committee wants to establish a process that the entire committee will vote and approve warrants at each meeting, or if the committee would like to designate one committee member to sign warrants and update the committee at each meeting. And that's the choice you have. But those are the two, that's sort of like the decision tree that's laid out in the Mass Municipal Act from a couple years ago. Um, and that's where we are. Is that fair? Yeah, and I just want to clarify if I can for the, the committee, but the reason why my name is on there is because uh, this question had actually originated with a different committee, and so this yeah. uh, has been sort of spilled over into the region, but I'm probably I hope it was the so. Amherst one. Yes. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know, this would be tremendously confusing. Um, sorry. Uh, Mr. Menino. Could you briefly update us as to why the current model has to be replaced? So, yes, because at the current time, the committee does neither of the two acceptable practices. So one is that the committee would literally read and vote at each meeting on the warrants. That, does, that has not been the practice of the district. Nor is there one committee member identified or designated 
to perform that function. So with the Mass Municipal Act, we, you know, districts or actually committees of all types, not just school committees, need to update their method of signing, of approving warrants, and these are the two methods that are, uh, were laid out in that law. So the so. Municipal Modernization Act that became a law yeah. is the reason we have to do this. I just had a, a um, clarification question. So this, this, the statement about the subcommittee model is also permissible. Is that a third option than what's described in the agenda? Because the agenda describes that the entire committee votes to approve warrants. So there, there's three options? Is that what? Correct. There, Right, so there would, um, I think it's, that's sort of a version um, of the first option you have, um, because there still is a public vote on warrants. Um, but, the, but technically the answer is yes. Yes. There's a third option. Okay. Yes. I mean, there's a third yeah. option. It's, it's just that, and I think that my get. I mean, it, forgive me for saying this, no, my guess is the reason why it's not listed under the vote is it wasn't anticipated that we'd go that way, because if we really want to vote on this at open meeting, we can do that right here. We don't need to create another subcommittee to do it. Yep. Okay. Um, sorry, Mr. Dennis? No, it's fine. Thank you, Spencer. All right. um, I just have a clarifying question about the option where we delegate to an individual. I'm just thinking um, about instances where that individual may not be oh, wow. available. So mm -hmm. would we be able to, del would, would we have like a, a chair and a That's a good question. Chair? Because if, if I'm on, Look. Vacation. I don't want to be worried that I'm holding up somebody getting paid <laughs> if I'm that person. Well, like you need an alternate, essentially. Exactly. Just somebody who can step in in their absence. So the way that uh, the first paragraph, third line from the bottom, if, and it's not totally addressing your point, but I think this is a conversation starter, perhaps. It's if the individual is not able to attend the meeting, they can provide this statement in writing to be read by the chair or superintendent or any other committee member. And is your question if that person wasn't just well, literally not there? It's party. also physically yeah. you have to sign the warrants, right? So You have to review them and sign them. Yeah. So let's say it's a good argument but that the person sick. goes on a, week, a vacation for 10 days with right. their family yeah. and there's a peril period in right. there, then what? Um, right. So I think that'd be another question to go back to. My uh, guiding assumption is that if it's not a subcommittee, there could be a backup. Delegate. Yeah, yeah. They, that person would then be able to delegate someone to play that role. Identif but you probably would want to have an identified alternate, right? Uh, that would be. That seems cleaner because if this committee is going to vote to identify someone as yeah. the designee, then you'd want to have an identified alternate voted by the committee as well. Yeah. Okay. What is? The yes, what's going? So this is just really in the weeds and pragmatic, <laughs> but thinking about the individual that's signing, in theory, that person could be signing them at these committee meetings, much as we do t today. Um, or would they? Would it be required that they come into the business office um, and sign? Mr. Mangano, you have an opinion. <laughs> <laughs> My preference would be that they would come into the business office either weekly or every other weekly, A, because that's one of the advantages. They can be signed more often. Yeah. Um, if we waited for school committee meetings, then it doesn't eliminate yeah. that. Um, but also, that's where all the invoices are, too. So if they had, if they wanted to pull the invoices, they're all right there, and they could easily do that. So there's some advantages to it mm -hmm. being in the business office. And this, this may sound funny, but the other reason is, too, is that if, if, if the person who's designated is going to have to fill in this information and read it, um, I am personally uncomfortable, is my opinion, with them doing it on the fly in these meetings and hope they get the number right. You know what I mean? Like, that's not funny yeah. about it. Yeah. Like, I, okay. I would, I would no, love, I'd love to have that, you know, the, dot, the I's dotted and the T's crossed mm -hmm. on whatever they're reporting out on. And I think they'd do that best if they were in the business mm -hmm. office beforehand. Uh, okay, anyone have an opinion, by the way? And I guess, I guess another question I have is, Anyone have a burning interest in being designated to? Because, by the way, the default answer is going to be we're probably going to have to vote to do this in these sessions if nobody wants to volunteer to go to the business office and rummage through all the warrants and sign them. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Ms. Azar. I'll do it. Well, that's wonderful. Uh, <laughs> Anyone want to be an alternate? We could live without an alternate for a while. We can live without an alternate for a while. I, I would be. This will be an alternate. Wonderful. 
So now what we need is we need a motion to do that. We need, here's my question, actually, uh, Dr. Morris, here's a question for you. Um, so I think we need a motion, like move, to establish a warrant signing process uh, designating the standard to sign warrants and update the committee at each meeting with Ms. Spitzer serving as an alternate. So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded. I realized I made a motion. I'll just go with it. Um, is there any further debate? Seeing none, all those in favor signify aye. It carries uh, unanimously 8 to 0. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> thank you. Thank you thank both. You. Nobody very much. To argue. <laughs> uh, and even better, we are now back ahead of schedule, um, which is just so cool. Uh, regional assessment. Regional assessment. <laughs> and just to clarify, real quickly, that previous vote, that's only for the region, right? So the Amherst still has to, Pelham st stays the same for now. Okay. Regional assessment update, regional assessment method update. Um, so quick recap, um, the method we voted to use for FY20's assessment method was to phase in 30% of the statutory method. The plan that was um, put together, or sort of the direction that was put together by um, advisory board and shared with all the town officials was to go to 40% for next year and then 50% the year after. And at town meeting, that plan was seemed like there was support for that plan, but um, we now have some rumblings that maybe um, at least which, one of the towns. Which town meeting? Or are you just four town choosing meeting. to four town meeting four in town meeting. December, January? Fe no, February. Yeah. February. Um, but over the past the spring and the summer, we've heard at least from one town that there's some people in that town that aren't supportive of that plan. Um, I went to a meeting in Shutesbury um, a few mm -hmm. weeks ago. And they basically discussed um, that plan versus going all the way to the statutory. They heard from some um, constituents that are advocating for going all the way to the statutory method. And so I talked to their town administrator today. They're going to be having a series of meetings over the next month or so. And by the end of November, they hope to give um, some direction to the school committee and to Dr. Morris and I on sort of what, at least from a board perspective, what their, their views are um, on the assessment method. Um, so there's really maybe four options to consider. And I'll lay them out for you really quickly. Um, there's to stick with the plan, which would be go to 40% um, statutory method for FY21. There is to go to model what going all the way to the statutory method would look like. Um, there's to do something in between. There's three options. There's there's a fourth one in there, but something in between. Um, so those are really what we can consider, and we'll be looking at models of that over the next month or so. Um, and really, this group and Dr. Morris and I are really trying to think about how we want to structure the four town meeting to be as productive, productive as possible um, and keep things on a, a positive track. When do we have that for now? December? December 7th. 7th? Yeah. Okay. I think the only, if I could add but, you know. just very briefly, the um, I'm very appreciative that the some of our local representatives have reached out and mm -hmm. are, will be attending that meeting because mm -hmm. I think they're, uh, what they've shared is that they're aware that there's some tension in some of the communities. They want to work with the towns to come up with mutually agreeable <coughs> solutions because they're dedicated to our schools staying as strong as they can and they know that that relies on, uh, kind of the, the fiscal piece has larger impact on that. So I just want to say publicly I'm appreciative that, um, sure. that the outreach was what occurred mm -hmm. and that our local representatives seem highly engaged in this question and it cuts across two local two state representatives and both seem highly engaged in the, yeah. in the work. That's great. Uh, so is there a thought to go to the other three towns? I'm sorry, what is, to go what? Is there a thought to go to the other three towns and apprise them of what's going on and talk to them? Yeah, so we have Take their temperature. Right. We've informed them a little bit of sort of the, the um, what's going on. We did talk about having an advisory group meeting sometime in November. Um, is, that, is that analogous to what we did What we did last time? year of having like one representative from each yeah. town um, to come meet with us, kind of share input and then report back. Um, 
it's unclear whether all the towns still want to do that or not before the four town meeting. Well, I just meant if you if we went to Shootsbury, mm -hmm. I mean the, maybe the, that was at their invitation. Yeah, that was at their invitation okay. to kind of hear the mainly to provide data um, and okay. sort of background context for um, the. I'm, I'm, the reason party. I'm asking, part of, I'm not trying to just like have a conversation. Sure. With yeah, you. yeah, no, <laughs> I mean, but I, the reason I'm asking is because I. Um, <clears throat> we can talk about this many ways, but there's there we all know that one of the possible outcomes, and depending on where the conversations flow, it's not an unlikely outcome. Mm -hmm. Could be that we can't get agreement this year between the towns, right. and so for that reason, as early and as fulsome an engagement as we can have mm -hmm. with towns, both collectively but also even individually, sure. make sure they're as fully apprised as possible is I think really advisable mm -hmm. um, and one reason is because I think it's entirely possible that when we go all the way to town meeting in Amherst Council next um, year um, we're not going to be able to an agreement and so we're literally going to be stuck in like DESE um, Division of Local Services um, purgatory for a long time <laughs> figuring mm -hmm. out whether we can then build agreement and I just want people to be prepared for it right. either prepared for that but also prepared in that context for what these conversations need to be at each step. And I don't, I don't, I mean, my hope is that when we go into December 7th, we don't want it to be a day that'll live in infamy. Right. In this period. <laughs> we um, want to make sure that, you know, we don't have an asymmetry between the towns and what their knowledge base is, right. so that they're able to come in really feeling informed and able to have a mutual conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I'll, we can certainly reach out to um, the towns it's just to give them an update sort of on where things are at. Yeah. Um, the, difficulty or just the, the uncertainty really right now is just sort of what guidance we're going to receive from um, finance committees and select boards in Shootsbury because I think they're still literally having those conversations about both extremes really is what they're looking at so um, but we'll reach out and keep them up to date. Yeah. Are there any, uh, any Spencer? So I'm I just want to thank you for all the hard work you're doing on this and the up, hard work please? you've been doing over the... Could you speak up, please? Yes, yeah, so I just want to thank Sean for the hard work he's been doing on, on this because it's it's really important for, for mm -hmm. our schools that we, we, we do come up with a plan. I'm also <laughs> I'm hesitant to bring this up, but I, I'm, I think everybody here is aware that you're leaving at the end of this mm -hmm. year. So in terms of planning for what will probably be a very... Not definitely, but potentially be a difficult um, negotiation period... Do we have a plan on who will step in to take over Sean's place? Yeah. Other than the, because I could see, obviously, I know we're hiring a new director of finance, but given his um, role in these negotiations and the importance of having somebody who's had the knowledge that he has now mm -hmm. historically, like, and I'm not talking about years back, but I'm just thinking fight. like a few months of, of experience on it. So, yeah, I would love to know what, we're, what our plan is. In that sure. Area. So, um, I think my, my short answer is that whoever replaces Mr. Mangano, I really appreciate Mr. Mangano that he has um, shared with me that he's willing to provide, you know, that context and ongoing support to make sure that person's successful, um, okay. even beyond, you know, not an official kind of... I want to come director. back to the four-town meeting in February is really yeah. when I'm angry now. <laughs> right. So that is, uh, just to be really clear because it's public, that is not going to happen. <laughs> it's it's a public find meeting. other I can things show on a Saturday to do, skiing, I don't know, playing, sledding, whatever it is. Um, but, um, you know, we've talked, and I just want to publicly thank Sean for um, being willing to provide ongoing technical support, you know, in, in limited capacity, but just to make sure that that um, institutional knowledge and memory does not go away on January 1st. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else from the committee? Anyone? Uh, no, oh. I, 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 so, I was just wondering, I mean, if, if, um, if we've had one town that has requested already, uh, I'm wondering if there's anything that this committee can do to urge our respective towns, the remaining respective three towns, to invite Mr. Mangano, mm -hmm. the superintendent, whomever, right. uh, to you know maybe have a sit down or even make a, a presentation sure. of sorts you know, yeah. to the individual town. Is, is that how that happens? I mean, I'm not trying to sound funny, but you know, it's, I love having these conversations on camera. Yeah. Like, do you have to be asked to the dance, or are you willing to call someone up? It goes both ways, I guess. <laughs> um, typically, I'm asked to the dance, um, but I, I usually offer an invitation. Um, <laughs> I, I, I don't invite I, I myself. Forgive me for going down. I guess we're in high school. Yeah. Forgive me for going down this, okay. this analogy. Well, I, just, I just meant, do you, can you, right. 
Can you initiate a phone call to set up these meetings, or yeah. do we really want to have our towns ask for? No, I, I, we can initiate. We'll reach out. I mean, we've got good contacts at all the towns between the town administrators and finance committees. Again, most of the towns, if not all of them, are a prize of sort of what really what we know to this point, which is there's uncertainty around it, um, and that there's been a push. They all know how the vote turned out last year, um, and that it was a vote attending that was closer than we'd be comfortable with. Um, but we'll reach out and offer. Again, it's not so much a data presentation because a lot of them have people who have been involved in this process. They know what the numbers are. They know the situation. But it's really just a check-in to kind of see how things are going. If they have any questions bef um, before we go to Fort Town meeting. I just want to know, I mean, technically, like, if, you know, there's anything that we need to do to get a ball rolling, mm -hmm. you know, I, I can volunteer myself sure. for, you know, for the Amherst uh, town. Um, but it just seems like it's a good idea to try to get as many different people who will be present at that meeting on December 7th or mm -hmm. whenever um, at the table to un an understanding what we're talking about before right. that actual meeting happens. Mm -hmm. Because oftentimes I find that uh, folks show up and the element of, of surprise, sure. if you will, from seeing the numbers on the screen tends to skew conversations in, you know, uh, unwarranted right. or, you know, un, um, desirable yeah. ways. Yeah. So if, if we can do that, that would be great. Okay. We've also had a lot of debate around whether or not um, the towns can be forced onto the statutory method mm -hmm. and what happens if you don't pass one. And you've gotten a lot of clarity around yeah. how that can would share actually some work. Of that information, yeah. And so I think, I don't, to be honest with you, I'm completely uninterested in talking about that as, like, a factual item like how does it work yeah. you know at the four town meeting we may have to anyways mm -hmm. but I mean to the, to the extent that we can actually socialize the information you've gotten as feedback to the four towns so that everyone's aware about what you've heard yep. um, well before they get to that meeting would be really desirable mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Fonch and then your hands up. Um, yeah I think Pardon? Leverett has a pretty good idea of what fa what it faces no. right. um, I had a meeting a couple of weeks ago with the board and the finance committee and using data that is current, assuming that there's no increase in the potential regional budget. Um, and if we go up, you, you have to understand we're also going to be hitting that two and a half max. Mm -hmm. And so they're trying to be very careful how much they increase as they go towards that Absolutely. figure. Absolutely. Okay? Yeah. Um, and just some figures that were played around with. And we have to also remember, and this is probably a good argument for regionalization, Union 28 for, for Leverett is going to go up about 11 grand. So after you take this, this, the regional budget and Union 28, if we go up 1%, it leaves about 30,000 for the rest of the town. That's school, fire, police, library. When you say Union 28, you mean just the central office for Union 28? Correct. Okay. So that's a pretty big increase. Right. Um, so that's sort of the playing field for us. And I think they're willing to go with what was done last year. Can't afford to go to the statutory method. Um, otherwise, there's nothing left for the town. May even have to increase what it pays for this regional budget. So, you know, some, some compromise has to be worked out. Um, why suddenly... Last year's formula is no longer right. valid is something that I think uh, needs to be answered. Right. And, I, and just really quickly, and again, a dilemma, if, if we do go the full statutory method, you're not going to have those numbers till the end of January, early February, to even really start <coughs> letting towns know what their assessments are going to look like, because it's going to be based on the governor's budget and the minimum contribution. So it's going to push everything way back. I think just in, in addition, the additional complication, excuse me, of that there's a huge education reform bill that's going to potentially be hammered out in conference committee or committee conference and then voted, uh, the timing of that plus the governor's budget is going to, um, I think there'll be potentially, even if there's good outcomes, the uncertainty of when that occurs and how quickly that can be fed into um, the governor's budget with accurate numbers, I think it's, it's an open question. Because uh, it is a new, it may, will be a new ball game if, if all these other things change. And again, I'm not, that's not a critique. It's just this year is not like every other year mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the governor's budget if this bill actually passes. Or if there's uncertainty whether the bill will pass, which is possible. Okay. Um, anyone else? Yeah. 
So. I'll just add that um, Shootsbury has been talking and discussing and wrestling with the direction that it's going since probably mid-July. And we're meeting on the 26th of November you know, to hopefully hammer out some kind of resolution between the boards and a select group of town members. And I'm just hoping that it works out for the best. We wish you well. Yeah. I think we all wish you well. I invited myself to that meeting, by the way, um, but I don't know if I got accepted. We can Snapchat <laughs> or text. I did. Or I talked to Becky today. Yeah. Uh, anything else? Wi-Fi worker. Snapchat. I think that's it. <laughs> okay. Some. It's getting there. Great. Thank you, Thank you much. very much, Mr. McGon. Thank um, you. Sure. Agenda planning calendar. That's an awkwardly phrased item, isn't it? Copy and paste it from the last couple no, of slides. No, I'm I'm open thinking, to any I'm other. Thinking, I'm thinking to change that. Suggestions. It's also referring to a different committee oh than gosh. this one. So. Ooh. Yeah, in fact, actually, <laughs> literally, literally <laughs> copy paste. Just to make it clear, <laughs> talk, about copy, about talk about copy and paste. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we're not doing that. <laughs> we're going to talk about the regional schools. <laughs> I'm hoping the calendar in the back looks like the correct one. It does. Yay! Uh, okay. Can I maybe offer just a little bit on the next meeting? Um, yes, of course. Yeah, so uh, as we've done in the past, so, so I'm a little concerned about how packed this meeting is, so I'll say that at the beginning. Um, but we have, uh, it, the plan is for it to be a joint meeting because there are the first two topics, which would be joint topics. One is a 6 through 12 math update. And... Uh, about six grades in, in two elementary schools in the districts that I serve. Uh, the math folks felt like you can't separate out sixth grade because you lose the full context of the curriculum change that occurred in math, gr math grade six through 12. Uh, so we asked to have that be done jointly. And the second item is the collaborative from educational service. We'll do a brief update on their programming, um, but there are two districts that have asked to join the collaborative. And to, for districts to join the collaborative, it's actually a very long, complicated, uh, as members of the, 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 um, the subcommittee members of the reps of the uh, CES know, a long, complicated process has to be approved by multiple levels at this, um, in the state. And it requires a certain quorum of votes of member committees. And so Mr. Deal and Dr. Deal and I talked, and we thought, uh, instead of making go to three meetings, and for some of you, Everyone here actually hearing him twice, if we could do it all in one full swoop, that it would work well. We also at least have slated right now um, the HR and Diversity PD update, uh, which we've done each year the last few years. Uh, school calendar review, which uh, we has uh, drafts of that have gone out to the through the Teachers Association. Thank you to Mick O'Connor, who's the president of APEA, in working with me and Ms. West Moreland on that. Um, it's a little bit of an odd year because it's a very late Labor Day, so the models look slightly different than the past couple years, so it might require a little more dialogue than the average year. We have um, some revolving fund uh, pieces to close. Uh, we have some debt, actually, Mr. Mangano, who just left, asked that we, we may have to make it not just rescind the authorized debt, but also to look at um, ongoing debt, and he wants to do more of a full update before he leaves, and that would be two meetings, both the November and the December meeting. Capital plan review, so Mr. Roy Clark's working on that. Um, fee review, and then wellness approach and update. So just even saying them, it probably is too many topics for one meeting. Um, and uh, I could definitely suggest some to move to December, but that's at least what's slated, and I haven't even talked about the grades band advisory um, as well. Where do you want grades band advisory? At December, because the meeting's after the 12th, right? It is. Yeah. yeah okay, so. so we have to put that in there. Yep. I will add that right in my notes. Um, I, my sense is the fee review could be pushed. Um, it's not that urgent, and our budget process will play out over time. Um, and the wellness actually might be better served to do in December because we're doing some work this Thursday, but we're also doing significant work um, on November 14th. Okay. Uh, and so I'd like to actually have that work have occurred before I report back to the committee. So perhaps if we move the, both those two items down, that takes the November meeting. So then we'd be looking for a fee vote on January 14th? Yeah. That'd is be there acceptable to the committee? Is there, um, is there any continuity <laughs> issue around having some different committee members, potentially? 
Uh, actually, a, a different thing we could do is just do it in January, the two meetings in January. Why don't we do that? Yeah. Like, since, since, since December 10th is already packed. Yeah. Why don't we just do that? 14th and the 28th. I just, I feel, I mean, not that we're, not that on some level, at a meta level, this is always going to happen, but when we literally have two consecutive meetings yeah. saying discussion, vote, and then we know there'll be some different members, that just feels weird. Mm -hmm. uh, unlike the budget where we kind of can't help it. Yeah, I, I completely agree. I think that's a good suggestion. Yes. I think earlier on this year we also talked about having a meeting once uh, if there are new members on the committee in December, um, having the budget informational session about how all of that stuff works sometime mm -hmm. in December. Right. Also. Right. As an additional meeting. Yeah. yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was, I was going to mention the same thing. I mean, I think we've been talking about this for a while. Yeah. It feels, it feels like really important to try to get this in here. Why haven't we gotten that scheduled anyway? We will. <laughs> we agreed that we would schedule it later, <laughs> and it's getting later now. So. Yeah, no, 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 no. I mean, I, this is like a pending item that's hanging there for no good reason. As far as I can tell. Oh, I, I, can, uh, I was going to say one other thing on this particular topic. Okay. Yeah. Is that okay? So, uh, not to be awkward, but in a week we'll know who new members will be, or seat not seated until January, so it may make sense to, I don't know how the committee would feel, wait till at least give them the option. They won't mm -hmm. be members in December, but... If, we, if the goal is to have some orientation that's inclusive of members who are new to the committee, we might want to wait to find out who that is, and that was the original thinking, and then schedule oh, yes. the meeting to make sure that yes, both I current committee members but also people who will be new are I able wouldn't, to be. I wouldn't mind finding a couple of dates, though, that we could okay. share. Very good. I just, because I just, I, I think it's a mistake to suddenly, like, wake up on November 6th and say, Let's schedule for three weeks from now, eventually three or four weeks from now. Yep. Because, exactly. you know, we all know that, like, once you get past Veterans Day, basically the rest of the year is a black hole that, like, sucks everyone's attention and time. And then all of a sudden it's, like, January 3rd or 2nd. Right? And it could be a wonderful time. People will be very happy. I'm not making any other judgment <laughs> characterizations about it. I mean, it could actually, people are too happy doing things that are non-school committee related. Yeah. Um, but the point is, we know that that's, the time is going to get away from us yeah. if we're not careful. I think that. that All right. I like that good. save at the end. That was. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to clarify the meeting on December 10th for the SETF. I believe uh, it's not an update. It's rather a discussion oh, of goals. Yeah. So SETF goals, which we've discussed for the p previous two years already, yeah. have, have been done really well, um, thanks to the subcommittee's work and budget guidance. So I just want to clarify that because once it goes on the agenda, you know that'll be important to to have that distinction. Sure, got it. Sensor, what is SETF? So that is the School Equity Task Force. Thank you. Sure. Is it gone? Um, look at. We had the first read of several policies at our last meeting. Mm -hmm. um, two of those probably will move to a different committee mm -hmm. um, rather than coming back to this committee. But two of them, the anti-bullying, which I don't believe there was um, much comment or reason on the policy subcommittee. We'll take another look at that on mm -hmm. the 11th. Um, and then there's also the anti-harassment party. So I don't know if we want... I know November and December are pretty packed, but I don't know if we want to. I, we sit absolutely for three we, we have to have it. No, we have to have. Got to have them back in November and December. We got to be vote. And we, if we're gonna, I mean, the committee's got to either vote it up or vote it down by December tenth. Mm -hmm. Period. Yeah. So we'll be meeting on the eleventh to mm -hmm. look at both of those both of those particular policies. Yeah. Um, so just give it, give us feedback, and we'll we'll, we'll fit them in. We're mm -hmm. just gonna we have to fit them in. So yeah, we'll fit I'll put in. a placeholder in there for the on the twelfth at least for okay. one of them. It seems like one is certainly ready to right. be ready to right. be considered. No, that's good. That's yeah. good. And anything else? Yes. A review of the sabbatical application approval process and the budget cost for the last five years for various reasons. That's good. I'm wondering what it costs. How, how is it done? I heard the first part. I missed them. So uh, a review of the sabbatical application approval process and the experience over the last five years. Sure. I'm um, just thinking of when to place that. Does it matter it sometimes? January, which is when sabbatical requests are typically considered. I mean, Anytime before, before the end of the year. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Can you, can you get that captured? Yeah. Okay. Sorry I missed the second part. No, that's okay. 
anything else? I mean, at some point later on, we're gonna. Oh, you have athletic fields on here for December tenth. Because I knew we we're gonna come back <coughs> to this time. Um, I don't hear anything else. Yes. Superintendent evaluation. I believe that was something that was also commented on last time, but just trying to plug some of those things in in advance. Uh, so that's in June, early June. Oh, those things are sort of absent here, yeah. Yeah, so I thought, and maybe I missed it, that I was uh, going to wait for guidance from the s evaluation subcommittee on the timing they wanted to have, because I think what I heard was different opinions based on the different town elections of mm -hmm. how we wanted to do it. So um, <coughs> I'm happy to plug it in, but my understanding was I was waiting to hear guidance from that subcommittee on... I'm going to ask a stupid oh, question. I think that do committee we, do, is sleeping. Do we, I, yeah, I, was, I, was <laughs> I think I am the chair. You are the, you are the chair, definitely. <laughs> and so I will... Oh, and Kip do you have, a, do you have enough Kip fellow doesn't members? Kip doesn't even know that he's a member of that one. <laughs> That's what I was wondering next. <laughs> Who else? Yeah, so right? Kip has no idea that he's even a member of that committee. Of what committee? <laughs> the <laughs> superintendent <laughs> evaluation subcommittee. Yeah. I know that. So, oh, you do? Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll, we'll, well, well, then isn't we'll that get, awesome, then? We'll, we'll talk. <laughs> what a happy thing. Yeah. All right, so I'm then sorry. we'll look for feedback, and then we'll plug it in. Uh, and I guess if there's any way that could play plugged in before December 10th, that'd be ideal. Including, what about a mid-year review? Love that in there. Yeah. Cool. Anything else? Do we have any gifts? We do not. Yes, there's. I saw it in the regional folder. Oh, you do? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That's why we need one person to sign these suckers. <laughs> is there really something in there? There is. I'm oh, so how nice is that? Okay. It's better. Okay. I move to wow. accept the following gifts um, from the Amherst Hurricanes Athletic Boosters, Inc., number 485, a donation for HUDL software in the amount of $1,999. Um, and from Mary Lou Conca, number 2597, Region Student Lunch Forgiveness in the amount of $63 for a total of $2,062. It's been moved. Is there a second? Second. Uh, moved by Spitzer, seconded by Funch. Yes. I just have a question. I've noticed that there has been um, a regular donation from one individual for the lunch forgiveness. And I'm just wondering if the superintendent can shed a little bit more light on where that money is going and how it's being handled. I can certainly get back to you next meeting. Um, I was told at 4.45 there was no gifts. Mr. Mangano snuck it in on me. So um, <laughs> I will, uh, but I've noticed the same thing that you've noticed. Yeah. Um, but I can definitely follow up with the committee. Okay. And so. I'll just mention that I may, I'm going to have to make another phone call, but I personally called the, the person that's made those donations because now it's $193 mm -hmm. okay. that she has donated to the lunch program. Yeah. And I will call her again and thank her. Mm -hmm. For this third one, this is the third mm -hmm. yes, row that a few. Yeah. she has done that. Uh, if that's if that's exhausted the uh, comment, um, we'll move to a vote. All those in favor of accepting the gifts as enumerated, please signify by raising your hand. It carries eight to nothing uh, and passes. Thank you very much. Is there a further motion, Mr. McDonald? Move to adjourn. Is a second. 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 Seconded by our uh, it is not debatable. All those in favor, <laughs> signify or raise your hand. It carries eight to nothing. Oh, we are adjourned.